don't eat my machine. No, it's not for you. Listen, <laughs> down. Right, you sit down. Uh -huh. Look at your co host. Oh, these cushions. Never ever having a feather seated cushion. Again. It's just a little one. It's like it's been better. injected with Both socks socks or something. It's got face fillers. Hi, sweetie. So you're going to need a glass of water. Hello. Hello. Oh, I've gone all sticky, have yeah. I? Go. Thank you, darling. And if you're looking at Kate. You're looking at Kate. I'm looking at Kate. That seems fine. Oh, this fizzy water's going to get me burping. Lovely. <clears throat> Are you going to lick your ass though, you know? Don't he use it. doesn't lick her ass. <laughs> oh, she's got an incredibly mournful face. I know. She's had a little bit of sad face. Mm -hmm. All right, love. Where are we going? I don't know. Are we going? Oh, beautiful. Uh, right. Look how regal she looks there. Sophie, just tell what you had for breakfast. Um, I had a protein smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Snickers. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Hello, and welcome to The Great Indoors, the podcast which reveals everything you ever needed to know about interiors and explains how to make it all really work for you in your home. I'm Sophie Robinson. And I'm Kate watson Smythe. And thank you all for so many nice messages about the last episode. It is great to be back. We are... No, and we're back indoors. And we're back indoors after the sheep. <laughs> safely back. No one will ever believe there were sheep in the silent sheep. <laughs> we are safely back in, in the great indoors, my happy place. And did and you wipe your feet before you came back in? Was it? Oh. Um, you know, were you trudging around my fields? I'm just uh, checking. I wiped them on the grass. <laughs> Instructed, should you not have a nice bit of frame typography over the front? Oh, keep calm, carry on, and wipe your feet. So, sadly, lacking there's no instructions. This country stuff doesn't come with any instructions. So, I've been having a bit of a nose around, not too much has changed. Unusual for you. The uh, gold beaker is still in the downstairs loo. I see that Just hasn't gone. You. Thanks for that. But, as well as that, today's topics include. The reasons, what, what am I saying? Am I saying, honey, I shrunk the house? I wrote that not as a thing to say, but just as a kind of... Yeah, I think I should use it. All right. So, what are we talking about today? Honey, I shrunk the house. The reasons behind my slightly current frayed nerves as I moved house last week. The new paint colours. Oh, there's a treat in store for you there. And Design Crimes is back. And this week, we are talking... Kitchen Islands, mm. yay or nay? Controversial. Apparently, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> but hang on, just before we get stuck into all of that, we must share an update on the Battle of the Bowl. So, last episode we explained that the Great Indoors podcast Facebook group was on fire with passionate argument about the rights and wrongs of the humble washing up bowl. Is there any point to them? Are they indeed a design crime? Well, clearly mentioning it on the show just fan the flames and the debate is still raging on. Listener Emily Coles is upset not just about the bowl, but how it's being used. Yeah, there are layers to this debate, clearly. She says, washing up bowls. Oh my goodness. I have only ever seen this done in the UK. And as someone who grew up in different countries, it still really baffles me. What I don't understand is why you would wash your dirty plates in a bowl of water that gradually just gets dirty and dirtier as you wash. By the time you get to the last pieces, you're washing your plates in murky, grey, dirty water with bits of food floating around in it. Here she puts a little um, sort of vom like emoji. Vom emoji. Instead of using a bowl, I lather up. Oh, <clears throat> instead of using a bowl, I lather up all my dirty items in the sink and then rinse them off under the clean water. But Kathy Taylor says no. The mistake is that Emily Coles is not washing up in the right order. <laughs> she says, if anyone was taught home economics at school, that will date them, <laughs> then they will have been taught how to wash up in a bowl. Glasses first, then cutlery, rinsed under cold water first, if particularly mucky, then the cleanest plates and bowls working up to the dirtiest. Then use this water 
water to rinse out the dirty pans and refill to wash those. Rinse items under cold water if needed before leaving to air dry. This will save both gas, heating the hot water constantly, and water washing up liquid. Something I think we all need at the moment. I'm carrying on. And listeners Jane Flame Taylor and Ray Ray agree. And there's also a theory about where the washing up bowl love affair began, which was posted by Tina Swindles, who says, I think it originated from when the sink was a dry sink with no taps or drain. Carry the bowl in from outside, clean, and then tip the dirty bowl back outside. That makes sense to me. <laughs> now there's a logic to it. I think we can get on board. <laughs> or maybe not. And last episode, is it you said? Not Kate said. Uh, no, I'm talking about Kate. Kate. Or am I talking yeah, about Kate. you? No, no, no. You're talking yeah. about Kate. Okay. And last episode, you said your granny used the bowl to tip the washing up water on her roses. And lots of you out there feel the same. Sue Fox even points out that eco washing up liquid is good for controlling aphids. And Christopher Barrett is cheering you on, Sue. He says, really encouraged to read so many people in replies who use grey water for their plants. Absolute stars. Round of applause, Moji. My husband is from Singapore and doesn't use the bowl, just runs so much water down the sink if he washes up. Re the whole issue of the water being dirty. Oh. <coughs> now, re the whole issue of the water being dirty, the same is true for having a bath. You're I putting don't have a bath for this reason. Carry on. Oh, well, let's find out. You're putting your oily, sweaty, grimy body, oh, speak for yourself, Christopher, <laughs> uh, into a bath full of water. The clever science is that the soap detergent used breaks down the grime and keeps most of it away from your clean body and also your clean crockery. Now there's a thought, doing your crockery and your body in the bath at the same time. You I don't think you're suggesting that, problem. but that's interesting, that science, isn't it? Because mm. that, if you remember right back to the beginning of lockdown when we had to wash our hands in soap, and soap was key because soap broke down the coronavirus mm. virus. Mm. So that's why washing your hands and soap was good. So yeah, well, maybe that works. But Fanny from Finland has another solution. Fanny Johansson Stockford. In Finland, most kitchens have two sinks next to each other. You have water and washing up liquid in one and you wash the dishes in that. And then the other has clean water and you put the clean ones in there to rinse before you put them in the drying cupboard. Oh, the drying cupboard. Oh, we need to I know more about the drying this. cupboard, Fanny. When I lived in Britain, she said, I found it uncomfortable that people didn't rinse dishes. They just dried them with soap stuff. So with... This is back to <laughs> tongue twisters again, isn't it? I found, when I lived in Britain, I found it uncomfortable that people didn't rinse dishes. They just dried them with the soap suds still on them. Oh, the plot thickens. And Sarah Bibby says, why stop at two sinks? Seriously, how big is Sarah Bibby's house here? <laughs> she says, I would love a triple sink. <laughs> <laughs> one for rinsing the majority of the grease off next full of soapy water then the third to rinse the suds off not going to happen most likely but i'd love that setup and says. then a drying cupboard whatever yeah, that well, is on go. the end of that rebecca catterall reminds us that a washing up bowl can work hard she keeps her sparkling clean and uses it um i'm not sure i go in for this for soaking feet in a home pedicure <laughs> I'm not sure about that, for washing your glasses in it. For making up wallpaper paste. Yes, done that. Not a weekly effect. Mm -hmm. Well, I, perhaps it is. An emergency bucket when a radiator leaks or needs draining. Okay, I'm on board with that. For hand washing clothes. And there's another one. Is there another one? I've got to turn the page of my script. There's so many. Oh, yes. No, and my other one is whenever there's a case of the uh, upset tummies in the house. There's always a washing up bowl by the bed. <laughs> Four. Right, okay, I think brilliant. I think there's just one more to yeah. And finally, anyway, and finally, Wendy Shaw sees it as an opportunity for a bit of design joy. She says, I've got a bright yellow bowl in my Belfast sink. Looks cheery. Oh, I hear you, Wendy. I will tell you something, having, since we recorded this original debate, mm. moved house. Bought yourself a washing up. Well, I've moved house and it has a lovely white ceramic mm. sink in it, which I really like. The mad husband 
hates it. Why? Well, for two reasons, actually. One, he says he's constantly worried it's going to look rubbish and stain and he feels he's got to clean it all the time. Right. And two, he's terrified of washing something up in it and it'll Wait, slip out of his hands and it'll it smash. That we may have to get a washing up on <laughs> I lost my place. Well, there we go. <laughs> Anyhow, if after all that you still want to fight about washing up bowls, then please head on over to the Great Indoors podcast group on Facebook and get stuck in. And I've actually written a blog post on this very, <laughs> very point with my roundup of the 10 most fashionable washing up bowls. So there you go, Kate, I'll forward the link on to you. Oh yes, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, you can chat about other stuff on our Facebook group page. Of course you can. And we'd love to hear from you on Instagram too, where I'm Sophie Robinson Interiors and she's mad about the house. And Brie. Prinky Plonky, do you want to go and put the risotto in and we'll do Honey, I Shrunk the House? No, because that is the topic. And okay. We'll do the thing. Uh, that was super fun. Welcome Thank you everyone. for writing that, Kate Taylor. Yeah. That yeah. was really, really lovely bit of producing there, wasn't it? Because I had all my a, money. That was a gift. Thank you so much. <laughs> right, so shall we go in with me asking how you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. How long has it been? A week. Well, well hold on. Been. When is this coming out? We Wait. moved on the 28th of September. It doesn't matter. This is going out next week. I think it's fine for me to say, okay. which we, you know, we yeah. can do it in real time. Yeah, okay. Uh, is it a week? It's not even a week. It's as we just... record it, it's not a week. Okay. No. So, Kate, as we record, it's not even a week since the big house. <laughs> How are you feeling? I think I might have a little cry. <laughs> You're on the verge, aren't you? I'm on the verge. Woman on the verge of a nervous oh. breakdown. Do you know what? It's clearly, it's fine. You know, we, we have been lucky enough to buy a new house and, you know, we're moving in. It's, I think what I'd forgotten, we lived in our last house for 12 years, uh, which for many people isn't that long. But actually, for both me and my husband, that's the longest we've ever lived oh. anywhere in our entire lives. You know, both our mothers moved houses right. a lot. I was at boarding school. So I, you know, those 12 years in that last house for me... Was a lifetime. Was a lifetime. Yeah. And... I think we underestimated the, the sort of emotional, it's not, as I said to you in the last podcast, I'm not necessarily emotional about, oh, this is the house where my child, you know, mm. was born on the carpet. I mean, they weren't, but it's not so much that because I think the ta you take the memories with you, but it's just the upheaval and it's really difficult to plan for that. And even, you know, intellectually, you tell yourself, well, I'm moving house and so I will, you know, Everybody says, how did you sleep? When you have that weird thing in a hotel of like, oh, I didn't sleep, it wasn't my own bed, you mm. know, definitely reached that stage. How did you sleep in the new house? Well, I don't know, it was my bed, but it wasn't my bedroom. <laughs> That's weird. Um, and I think I had underestimated just that moment. And then it's been kind of full on of unpacking and trying to, you know, how does the heating work? Do the radiators yeah. work? Nothing's familiar, is it? Nothing's and familiar, and that's tiring. how stressful yeah. being in a, not only an unfamiliar place, but your life packed away in boxes. Yeah. I mean, I've you shared the pictures on Instagram, <laughs> literally mountains of, and I know you put a lot in storage too, right? Well, I think we, we were quite careful, we thought, when we went round the old house of, you know, I knew my kitchen table would be too big, so that was going to storage. I knew the sitting room would be too small to have two sofas and the chaise long, so that's gone into storage. I had thought that we were not people who gathered lots of clutter, mm. but we are both by trade journalists. We have boxes of newspaper of archives. Oh, really? A news what yeah. clippings? Yeah, clippings from stories I wrote twenty years ago. And you they do. I do not. have all those. Well, those have gone in storage, but it was all the books. And when they were, they, so we put a lot us, of books. we planned for a certain amount to go in storage, and we thought we'd done quite well. And then we added a bit more when they were packing. And then when they started unpacking, they were bringing all this stuff in the house, and I went upstairs. To, because they bring in your clothes on those special cardboard boxes with hangers in and they want those back. So they sort of dumped all those in the bedroom and said, can you just empty those really quickly? So this was the point. I had always thought I didn't have a particularly insane amount of clothes because turns out I had quite an insanely large wardrobe. So everything fitted. Suddenly moved into this wardrobe, the width of an alcove. So everything's on the floor, can't hang anything up. And I was madly stuffing things, you know, back in suitcases and throwing them on the floor and my husband just called up the stairs and he went um could you 
can you just come down here a minute? It's all just gone a bit mental. <laughs> <laughs> and I went herring down the stairs to discover that they'd started off with four removal men, decided that hadn't been enough. They'd upped it to seven. Mm. So it was like a chain gang of boxes coming in. And the back half of the sitting room where I had planned to put my two little pink armchairs in front of the fire um, and my desk, you know, this was all how it was going to be until we built the bookshelves. The entire half of the room was boxes of books, almost to the ceiling, and there was no They're floor space. Boxes. They're heavy boxes. There was no space for anything else. And so then these two removal men turned up with, with our coffee table. And we had a big coffee table in the old house. Oh, they was was loving you. I hope you made them lots of tea. Lots of tea and biscuits. <laughs> they came in and they were like, where do you want this coffee table? And I was like, I never want to see it again. Take it to storage. <laughs> so that went. And then a few minutes later, they came in with the sofa bed for the spare room, equally full of boxes Ooh. and stuff. And I was like, no, no, take it to storage. And they were like, this is going to cost you. I'm like, I don't care. There's no room. So literally yes. we were shipping stuff out as fast as it could come in so there we go I, so, uh, it's interesting isn't it the the concept of how, when you are downsizing trying to visualize how well like you said in the headline honey i shrunk the house i mean yeah. literally the space is shrinking down you know no matter whether you're going from a house to a smaller house or down to a smaller flat or whatever it's this concept that you're going to have too much stuff and what do you let go of and i think the lesson here is You've probably spent quite a lot of money moving stuff that you're actually going to end up having to get rid of, be that yeah. books or pieces of furniture. And in an ideal world, one would have got rid of it at the beginning of the process and just took what you needed. But trying to visualise what that is, like you say, how many shoes can I fit in the shoe rack? How many dresses can I hang in the wardrobe? How many books can I Well, and also it's, it's all that memories. I mean, I totally understand why downsizing when you're much older becomes so difficult. Not because you need all that stuff, mm. but because it, that stuff is all attached to your life and your memories. And I think there's a fear as you get older that if you don't have that visual reminder in front of You'll you, forget you might forget it. Yeah. So, you, so you want to see it. But what I think has been interesting for us is our initial plan was that we were going to downsize in a few years' time to, to maybe a two- or three-bedroom flat. Right. And... We've been. Really, do you think you might downsize again? Well, I, I obviously we're at the never going to do that again moment. Right. But but we might. A, I think we might be better prepared for it. But also because we ended up doing this move sooner than we planned, we 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 are in a smaller house than we were, but we still have bedrooms for the boys. So that I think has been really lucky for us. It's allowed us to have an interim period because I'm looking at all these boxes and I said to my husband, you know, imagine if we had gone straight to a two bedroom flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we would have nothing left. So we, we're settling into that and there will be, I think what will happen is the stuff will go into storage and either it will move, as I said to you, the dream is to be able to buy a place in Italy, either mm. it will go there or gradually it'll be that thing where you haven't looked at it for so long and you yes. realise you don't need it. So yes. there's that kind of halfway house. That you have to pay for that halfway house because storage is yes. not cheap. Well, it's, it's a lot of money keeping hold of those memories. Yes, it gets, there you it go. It's pricey. Yeah. I mean, we went through a really similar process with my mum when my family sold the family house, which was a sort of five-bedroom house in Warwickshire, and she ultimately moved to her, the annex, which is, as you know, two bedrooms. Just, just called it yeah. in her pyjamas. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> two bedrooms. And open plan as well. Yes. That's the other thing. If you're moving from a house with lots of walls to an open plan space, it's like double the trouble. And we ended up, because I couldn't do this for her, it was too emotional, I was getting too mm. cross. Because at one point, you just there were rooms you couldn't use because you couldn't get in them because of the boxes, yeah, like the spare yeah. room. Um, employed a professional decluttering expert to come in and help her move through this process because she was so stuck to the emotion of it. And she did this brilliant thing where she would create three piles. Yeah. Definitely going, definitely keeping, need to Not think sure. about it. Yeah. And mum said what was so extraordinary and slightly traumatic at the beginning is if mum said, no, I don't want that, she said, literally, it would disappear, go, and it was in the van. It was just out the house. And yeah. she remember going, oh my God, that's gone. And then she said something happened that it started becoming quite thrilling. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. she started feeling lighter yeah. and more energised. So... I think for anybody who is struggling to get rid of stuff and it's very tangled up with emotion and memory and sentimentality, 
is you can have people to come in. And, and I think it's why you need someone objective because yeah. otherwise you just down that rabbit hole of memories and then you think you can't ever get rid of it. We I had a we moved years ago, we had our first two bedroom flat and we discovered when we were moving that I had somehow got my history O level band of sheets, which for anyone who's younger than I am won't even know what a band of sheet is. And it was way before the days of photocopying and you would write the notes by hand with carbon paper yes. and then print them and it was purple ink in handwriting. Wow. And I had all my history O level band of sheets. Those. Well, they, I don't consciously remember keeping them, but I wow, clearly, that's... they had come with me. Yeah. And my husband was like, you know, really? I think, you know, we need to, we've got a child, we're married, we've grown up, we need to move on. And he wanted to get rid of them. And I was just like, but you're throwing my childhood in the bin. And clearly not, but you, you get so down that rabbit hole that, and feel that your life won't be the same if you get rid of it. I so. think the thing is, is looking at them, I kept all my sketchbooks from art college of everything that I'd ever designed with a view that one day... It'd I'd be look... worth some money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I thought maybe one day I'll go back to having a creative hobby, be it jewellery design or furniture design or ceramics, that's what I used to do at uni, and I could go back through these sketchbooks and be sparked with inspiration. But actually, they went... We did a big chuck out a couple of years ago because they'd all just gone down the stables. And I looked at these and I thought, this is like over 20 years since I graduated and I have never it's looked time. at these sketchbooks. Yeah. But it still ripped my yeah. heart out to let them go because it was also a reminder of a really happy, creative time. But yeah, it just... The, the one limit. thing I think I have learned, and it's, it's very early days, but someone actually messaged me on Instagram saying that she was trying to help her mother downsize. Um, and it was very difficult because her mother was, so I'm not going to go into the names, but her mother was quite resistant and was finding it very difficult, completely understandably. Um, but they, you know, they had a sort of, she's got to have a two bedroom flat. And she was like, but I need a third bedroom or I need this, I need more and I can't possibly go into this small space. I imagine perhaps much as your mother might have felt because you were used to having space and you feel you need more space. And what we found because we'd started off looking at flats was that we were we were potentially looking at moving out of the area where we live to find a flat that would give us a bigger garden all that extra bedroom and more space and actually what it came down to we realized was that we needed to stay in this same network of streets at all costs and that it it really is about the location because you know we've been in there two or three days as we record now and we've had friends who've walked around from their house mm. we we you know we've walked to another friend's house so although so the house still is in your community we're still we? in that community nice. so the spaces feel different but our lives on the outside haven't changed and and, and everything's when I'm, still familiar everything's still familiar and when i said that to this woman she said she said i'm going to tell that to my mother because I think that is the key. Maybe you end up with something, there's always a compromise, isn't there? So maybe her mother will have to have something slightly smaller, but she will still be able to see her friends mm -hmm. and be in that community. Whereas having that slightly more space and losing your community, it's, it's fine when running. you're in your thirties and you're driving on the school run or mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're more mobile. But if you're older and your world shrinks because you can't walk half a mile to the shop then mm. it's really key that you pick that half mile mm. really carefully mm. i know i think it's i mean obviously my mum relocated as well to your garden to our <laughs> garden and to be closer to us so she's she lost that community I mean, it's 10 years or more now since she mm. moved um but i'm noticing as she's getting older now and isn't going out so much that that's now becoming i just think if she still lived in the village where we grew up She'd be chatting to the old boy from the allotment. She'd be, oh, then in the post office and the wood shop's gone. Of course it has. But, yeah. you know, it used to be jumping in and, and talking to, to, yeah, just people you've known yeah. all your life. And that's really nice. But it's obviously not possible for everybody, yeah. sadly. I think if you can stay within your community, that, that would be my big takeaway. But obviously, as I unpack more boxes, throw more boxes away build a lot of clever storage, I will have more thoughts on downsizing. This is, <laughs> on, this is an ongoing story. This is not breaking news. This is a running story. This is going to run and run and run. Yeah. I think one thing that um, is important to flag when you're downsizing is you are obviously decluttering and getting rid of stuff. And again, for my mum, this was something particularly painful, not just because of the memories, but the, that she hated the thought of throwing away useful things. Mm. 
And another great thing that the decluttering expert brought with them was that they have those straight to source um, destinations for the stuff. So she was like, brilliant, these duvets and pillows, I'm taking them to the refugee char charity. Yeah. Right, these are really good quality ornaments, but right, right, I'm taking them to the charity shop. Um, oh, this you might actually get some money for, so let's put that on eBay. It's the destinations, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and is I the, think the you can really, bit. again, if you're struggling to, to declutter and get rid of stuff, knowing that it's going to be useful to someone else, yeah. I think it's a conversation I have with my mum a lot, rather than it sitting in your garage, sitting in your storeroom, not doing anything, imagine if that was being used and enjoyed by somebody else. And I think it's it's either taking the time or, or getting in the professional to help you move this stuff on, because we found, particularly post-lockdown, that the charity shops in our area are overrun with stuff. They don't want your slightly moth-eaten cashmere mm. anymore. They've got loads of it, but... Have they? Where? Which... Oh, my God. <laughs> I need to go to the North London charity shops. Clearly, I do. But, but, they, but they have been able to be more discerning about what they want. So then it's about finding a charity or, mm. you know, I think... Or recycling. Um, on Instagram, lovely Emily Wheeler one runs Furnishing Futures, which is about women in mostly women, in furniture poverty, who are being rehoused, and they are rehoused, which is wonderful, but then they end up in a house with no furniture. So it's, you know, it's finding the right place to give the stuff, and if the shortcut is paying a professional to come in and go, I know what you can do with that, that, yeah. that, that, and that, that's worth it, well, because then you don't feel wasteful. There's free yeah. circle, Facebook marketplace, there's loads of places. Yeah. And I think it's a circular economy. So here's my next thought for people who are downsizing is quite often you will find that the furniture you're taking from your larger property is not the right size of scale yeah. for your new property. And this is something as well that I think people need to get real with. If that sofa's too big in your living room, your living room's just going to feel packed and tight and yeah. choked up. Coffee table's classic. Too big of coffee tables. So I think, again, you know, it might pain you that your sofa's lovely and, per, you know, you spend lots of money on it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there will be somebody who will pay you good money yeah. for that sofa if it's in good condition. And you could consider buying a second-hand one instead. But don't compromise. I mean, when we moved to this house we weren't downsizing we were upsizing actually but i had already inherited quite a bit of my granny's furniture and actually there were just some pieces most of it actually just didn't fit the room's yeah. layout so i had to get really ruthless and it was a really interesting conversation within the family because this is my granny on my dad's side my dad was like yeah get rid of it he's not very sentimental at all and his brother was like oh i'll have it and my bro and my uncle my dear dear uncle literally has a garage full of all my granny's furniture because he can't let it go but he can't get it in yeah. his house either <laughs> so be, be a bit more like my yeah. dad i think in this scenario and make sure your home works for you and isn't just a museum for the pieces of furniture yeah that you know you've always had and then i think the other thing to think about which is i know you're already on the road with this but I think it is really hard. It can feel very negative. It can feel quite depressing when you're going from a large space to a small space. Um, is to keep the inspiration alive. And this is where I think planning your new colour schemes, mm. having a vision, you know, jump on that Pinterest board, have that box of samples, start playing with your layouts, you know, do measure drawings of your room so you can work out what's going to work is in a way something that keeps the dream alive a bit when it all gets a bit gloomy and you're surrounded by boxes and you're just having to get rid of stuff you love. But also I think it can be about, you know, embrace changing style. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. I don't know what your mother's house was like before. Very um, traditional. Very traditional. And she now lives in a modern annex. Her mm -hmm. furniture is quite mid-century. She did have this bright yellow sofa I'm yes. now sitting on and she's changed it. But there's... It, it can be a moment to go, you know what, I'm just going to have a bit of and a change she of feel. loved that. It was like new home, new life. Yeah. You know, yeah. and being in an open plan space with big windows rather than an old creaky drafty yeah. house, she's now like triple glazed or heart's content. Yeah. So Hence walking around in her pyjamas. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't even need to get dressed anymore. <laughs> Bring it on. Yeah. I mean, I've got a couple of other thoughts, but I think we've kind of, I think we've gone. I think we've yeah, done the answer. Right. Have we? Yeah. Have we finished it? Um, I mean, we could just... Do... I could take that line out from earlier and go, this is not breaking news, it's in run and run. That's quite a good way to put yes, it. Yes, okay, nice. Let's sure. cut that out there. Um, so clearly I'm still, as you say, on the road, maybe on the runway, having quite taken <laughs> off, if we're going to have really landed. Hammer, the, <laughs> hammer this analogy um, to, to its, uh, we're going to hammer this analogy to death, um, mixing metaphors. I'm on the beginning of this journey of downsizing, so it's not breaking news, I've done it, 
there will be more to come. This story's going to run and I'm run. Not out the other side yet, I'm are not. you? I'm not. There we go. Right, go and put the risotto in. Okay. And then we're doing paint colours. Yes. You off? You off? They have it with the continuity of this thing. Really? Go in here. No? You go. <laughs> no, she's going to a different bed. I love how she digs herself in, look. Yeah. <laughs> Never seen a dog do that. So funny, funny. I love how Lucy likes to be buried. I've never I seen know, a dog do that. I know. She's completely gone under yeah. the cushion. And... She always likes to have a blanket or a duvet over her. She sits in Tom's office and he has a completely, he just puts loads and loads of heavy blankets on her. And she stays there all day. Yeah, she is. Right. So, Kate, woohoo! New paint colour. Sorry, I just thought I needed to wake you up. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I'm here. Right, go, go, go. Back in the room, back in the room. Back in the room. This time of year, all the paint companies yeah. are bringing out their new colours for 2023. And we get a little bit of a handle on the trends. Well, uh, but also, word. it is a bit of an event because mm. you and I both went to the launch of the new flower and ball collection. Yes, that was a hoot. 11 colours, yeah. but they only ever release new colours once every three years. And the pandemic threw them out. So this is the first time they've done new colours since 2018. Mm. And they've done 11 new colours. Yes. So and patent paint and paper library 32 new colors i mean that's nice. a whole collection in itself yes and then of course we always have the dulux color of the year yeah so what are we seeing i think if we can give our listeners a broad brush like we did there uh we... oh god <laughs> Yes, a broad brush. Uh, as we roll out the new uh, the new paint colours, what we're seeing in terms of what, what does this... Because what I love about the new paint colours is usually this is an insight into what brands think are going on inside our minds. Yeah. It's very it gets very psychological, doesn't it? Oh, we feel like you need a bit of this, so this is the colour down the wall. Well, there was outrage, that. wasn't there, when... I can't remember whether it was Dulux or Pantone did their colours in the... It must have been... I have to now remember it. It was Dulux, and I can't remember the name of the colour, no, but it, it was brown. brown. Yes. And everybody was like, we're in a pandemic, just that give was us 2020, the yellow. wasn't it? But they, yeah, they were talking about it being the mood. It was 2020, and mm. bear in mind that the Dulux colour of the year that they've just announced now is actually 2023. Quite and it's quite brown, again. Well, yes, but there, yes, it's a year ahead. Well, let's dive brown. in with that. Brown. Let's, let's dive in with brownish. Let's dive it's in yellow. with that. So headlines is, Nature Gives Life to Dulux's Colour of the Year, 2023. And it is called Wild Wonder, connecting us with the magic of nature, bringing a sense of energy and positivity into your home. That is a big, big claim. From well, a colour, interestingly... Which is kind of like, let's just describe the colour. It's kind of like straw, straw, hay, hay, I pale like, hay. The straw's quite yellow. Hay's got a t tinge of the green. Do you think? Is it a hay? hay it's a, it's a, it's a pale subdued yellow. And weirdly, given my my you know famous for my love of yellow, I don't hate that yellow. But I'm not sure it's the energetic feelings of wonder that they're talking about. I think it's more of a sort of restful, Here's quite a color. shy yellow. Here's the colour, a hue inspired by the warm tones of a harvested crop with the upbeat glow which connects us with the cycles of life, creating a sense of energy and positivity. I agree with you, I'm not getting energy. No. Because it's very, very subdued. Um, not getting much of a glow either. No, upbeat, these aren't words that I put with it. I think it's quite a nice, soft, relaxing colour. I think so too. I mean, I, really, I, mean, I don't hate it, and we quite often do feel I mean, that we don't we quite like that do you know, well, this is the This is the shut the front door moment. I don't think I hate it either. Oh, steady. I know! Oh! oh. Well, listen, Marianne Schillingford, the creative director of Dulux, she says, Wild Wonder speaks to us in a language we instinctively understand. There you go, just leave that with you. Uh, nature is what inspires us and makes us feel better in our lives and in our home. That's why, for the first time in 20 years, our entire colour palette, because it's the palette yes. goes with this colour, is inspired by the rhythms of the natural world. And do you know what? I'm kind of here for it. But I think she said that last year. No disrespect, Mary, I love her. Last year was it Tranquil Dawn? Yes. I mean, that was all about the natural world. Yes. I'm not. I'm not. You know, this is this is a bit of the Miranda Priestley floral story, <laughs> groundbreaking. You know, inspired by nature. I'm. I'm not sure it ever isn't. Yeah. But no. I and I also think when people are feeling, <laughs> I'm going to stressed. I mean, tearful. that's an un, looking tearful. <laughs> 
on the verge of Heaven's Breakdown. Yeah. I mean, it couldn't get more hairy out there right now. I mean, politically, financially, there is nothing certain. No. It's all just a big whirly gig. And I think this is when um, colour forecasters look to nature and the softer colours yeah. tend to be less threatening, more reassuring. Anything to do with nature makes us feel grounded and safe. And that is why... I can't deny it. I need a bit of... Well, you see, when I think you need a bit of dry grass, something like a bit of dry grass to make you feel better. That's a different type of grass. But but this is a whole thing, I mean, this is your whole life upending, because you said, I think almost last time we were in this room, which could be years ago by now, Mm. but you you were like, oh, I'm rethinking my maximalism, I want it to be Mm. more calmer. Um, That hasn't happened, has it? It hasn't happened, but you, you have thought about it you've talked about I it so these colors it. coming it is through. never going to happen because if i was to strip out all this color and paint it wild wonder i mean it yeah i'd be i'd be nice and calm and relaxed for all of half an hour before i was like drained and worried drained and worried yeah so i think um i think you have to know yourself yeah i think that's really with all these trends you have to know yourself because they're only going to speak to the yeah. few people it resonates with but i think as a wider message I get where Dulux is coming from and the whole of their palette that have have um, names like Spun Mohair, Violet Dream. Actually, I don't know whether that's a good, that's a good name for a paint colour. I don't think we want Violet Dream. I don't want Violet Dream anywhere no. near any Violet other. Dream. <laughs> no. no. Uh, Hazy Morning, Fresh Foliage, yes. Sea Holly. This is more like it. Silver yes. Lichen. Old Time Olive. Oh, yes. we love a bit of Old Time Olive. Mouse Tail. Yes. Oh, we've come over a bit far on board. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, and I'm... Wondering whether we're seeing this across all the paint colour trends, these richer, chalkier, na- nature inspired. They're very, very earthy. I mean, that struck me with the, the Farron Ball and um, that idea that, that ha- we all know this, how we live in our homes has changed since the pandemic. And some of their colours, they are linking them to an, to an eddy being, you know, a swirl of water mm. when everybody's gone wild swimming. I'm not going wild swimming. <laughs> Looking at the sheep is about my limit. <laughs> waving at the sheep, but you've done it. Well, you've done a bit of wild bathing, yes. in your outdoor bathtub. Um, but again, those are Farron Ball always does natural colours, but actually they have got some bold ones. There's one in there called Bamboozle, mm, which is a kind like of a strong orange, orange, orange terracotta. Mm. So they're not they're not shying away. These are not these are not non colours. It's not all sort of pale and neutral. washed out. There's some strong colours in there, but they're I don't even know if this makes sense. They're, They're muted rich. strong. They're rich, aren't yeah, they? They've got They're tonally warm yes. to them. And Fire and Ball typically do do a lot of this type yeah. of palette. I mean, anyone who studied colour psychology or with me will know this is what we call the autumnal palette. Yeah. You know, you look out the window in autumn when all the fabulous summer colours are fading. To, well, they're not fading. They're kind of like turning to these lovely rich reds yeah. and ambers and conquer browns and moss greens. And they have an inherent warm and intensity and richness to them and that's what fire and ball are really doing with this with a lot of these but so my question is and Mm. we'll come on in more detail to paint and paper library who've launched 32 colors and that i mean i just swooned with joy when i saw them again it's more of this and you're using those words it's conquer it's moss it's Mm. foliage i mean beautiful berry colors and i thought to myself cue sex in the city voiceover I thought, <laughs> could they all launch these colours in summer? Or would we look at them and go, oh, no, it's not the right time mm-hmm. of year. I wonder, because they've launched these autumnal colours in autumn, I don't know whether that's a coincidence, whether there's a link. I think it's a coincidence, because clearly paint colours and choosing colours for your home isn't something you do at a certain time of yeah. year. And I would say that we're not really influenced. You know, if you're decorating in autumn, are you going to pick an autumn colour? Probably not. What I think is interesting is what these colours really represent psychologically. And they are, I mean, to go back to the Dulux press release, they are these colours of nature. Mm. They ground us. And they have an intensity to them as well. Even the paler neutrals, they still got an intensity of pigment that just is heavier than your fresher, more chromatic pastels or the sort of electric brights that I like that are quite ziggy and uppy. These well, are like weight you down. They're like a weighted throw. I mean, they're these throws with all the glass. Apparently, beads they're in. amazing. I must I know. get one. I, yeah. I was looking on Amazon as well the other day yeah. because I heard that they're really good. They're supposed to like reduce anxiety. They're like having a hug. Well, these colours are like the weighted blanket of paint colours. 
by saying it, you might be right. I mean, it's 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 difficult because those are that that is my colour palette. Mm. So for me, so it's days. just more of the same. Very happy. Got a lot of walls to paint, <laughs> and I'm thinking this is great. But so so for me, it's not new. It's just more of the same, and it's familiarity, and I love it. I'm thinking you might be looking at that and going, oh, where do I go? You know, yeah. where do the people who come from in to to use your phraseology? You know, that cleaner spring fresher mm. well you could call it upbeat i find the autumnal colors quite upbeat but yes mm. where where are they going to go i mean obviously you, there's paint you can buy paint anywhere but it's it's not talking to everybody these new well, colors keen islands what have they done <laughs> <laughs> so we are used to just a bit of background um we there are two main color of the year events i would say every year in the uk one is dulux um, and the other one is Panto. Which we haven't had yet. We haven't had Panto, and I think it comes out in November, mm. but of course it may be late, who even knows anymore. Now, Panto always make a thing that theirs is not a colour necessarily for decorating. It is a colour that is a mood. So they had last year, I think that the old Very Perry, didn't they? I don't think it was called Very Perry, but it got caught up with a sort of, it was called Perry. I forgot to put time on lunch. Do excuse me. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. So they did a colour called Very Perry, yeah, which everybody which immediately violet. said, oh, it's a menopause thing. Um, but it, yes, it was quite a it was quite a violent violet. And before that, they did that very pale grey with that zingy oh, neon yellow, violet, which yeah. I couldn't bear. And that, again, upset a lot of people because mm. people look at that in the way they look at Dulux and think, oh, I can't paint my walls that colour. That's kind of not the point of it. It's the mood. So with that in mind... Those are the two big colour of the year events and various other paint companies have now started to do either a launch of new colours or a colour of the year. Into the fray comes Mylan, very old, traditional, I think paint the last paint, paint, paint yeah. company in London, still manufactures in London. I think Little Green is manufactured in Manchester. Into they come. Farragall and their, Dorset. Farragall and Dorset. Mm -hmm. Mylan's, whose paints are, again, very much, they have a huge range, but their palette is quite muted. And they have colours like Rothschild Street and yes. Downing Street and Pall Mall and St James's. So you can see where we're going with this tradition. Out they come with their colour of the year. And it's, I mean, it's, it's Barbie core, it's neon paint. <laughs> and it's bomb for anybody who wants it. They do a range called the Film, Television and Theatre Range, FTT, and it's 006. Right. And I did actually, in the old madhouse, I did my gold ceiling was FTT 002. That was my metallic gold the ceiling. Blue the shiny It was not. Even you said it was the shiny blue. We're not going over the street. We're here to talk about 006. Barbicore, bright neon pink. Yes. And I actually was so shocked when I saw this that I... I emailed them. I emailed them and I said, <laughs> I said, dear Mr. Mylands, are you having a laugh? I said, <laughs> I did sort of say, have you done this to get attention? Because, you know, it's... And it's, and it's a breaking the mould from what everybody else is doing. Absolutely gone in the opposite direction from what everyone else is doing. And again... So it's a very punchy neon lipstick. Yeah, I mean, I can't see... For me, I can't see and it's that I would glorious put it on my because Mylands as well make you know really good quality high pigmented paint. Paint it's going to be a really sexy paint. I think it's know. great downstairs. It's, 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 I'm it's not bigger sure than it's, Barbie. It's bigger than Barbie. <laughs> but so I said to, and I got a message back from Dominic Myland himself. Oh, nice. oh yes. <laughs> About. Straight to the top. It got escalated. Dominic, escalated, mate. Escalated, what escalated. have you done? <laughs> and he said to me can't argue with this it's an unfailingly cheerful and bold pink proving not only to be incredibly popular but also more enduring than just another trend or fad mm. i'm not sure about that it is um, it is upbeat it is cheerful it yes. is popular i don't know whether that's feeding it's a into classic Barbie. though it, you know you see the diana Reland, that hot pink, oh, that hot pink yes. i mean yeah it isn't i don't think it's a trend i think it's a real core classic that hot pink you what you can't get your head around is where to use it you've immediately gone to the downstairs because that's the tiniest small yes <laughs> so 
I think you're right. And he's, he finishes off and said, you know, although it's the colour of the moment, it's a stylish shade you won't mm. get tired of anytime soon. I think if it's a colour you love, absolutely. It's part oh, of I your mean, lexicon. It's part of your palette. I've already redecorated my hallway in it. I mean, can you imagine how fun Well, it's it not dissimilar from your stair runner. That's why I've already got, got a, slightly I've got a bit of, bit of uh, that colour. But I think it, it's a, it is a strong, saturated, arresting statement, positive, in your face. And in the kind of like... I don't know, yes, we could all get very like, oh, the world's so stressful, let's paint everything brown. This is the antithesis to yes, that. Yes, cheer ourselves this up and go This is two pink. fingers yeah. to everything else and saying, well, I'm keeping the happiness and the glam and the fabulousness going in my own home. And I think, yeah, a hallway with like crisp white woodwork would look amazing. No, I'm going to disagree with you there. I think clearly you want a hallway that's kind of navy blue, a darker colour than your pink, navy blue. Or even a paler pink, anything. <gasps> Not white. I've banned the white skirting boards. When are you going to get the hang of this? I banned them like three series, four series ago. Still not listening. No, white's fine if you put it with something like that. I think it would look. I think it would look awesome. It would look great in a bathroom, in a dressing room, kitchen. Have a bright. Oh yes, come on, oh, kitchen. I feel a bit. I think oh, I might cry. I, love I feel it. a bit tired again. <laughs> but I tell you what, it does go to show because we always come back to this and we always you know should bear this in mind the thing about trends is if this you know new colors of the year proves anything it's that there isn't a trend and you don't have to because you might be like me very comfortable in your muted autumnal palette or you might be looking at that neon barbie pink and planning a redecoration of your hall or your kitchen so ultimately find the colors you love be true to yourself I think this is, that's the message, and that's actually been, I mean, that Joe said home at the Farrow and Ball um, press event where they launched all these colours, that was her headline, is our homes have never meant more to us. Yeah. You've really learned that, haven't we, in the last couple of years. The colour you roll out on your walls deeply affects how you feel about life, your psychology, so there is a colour for everybody, just get the one that makes you happy. How long have we got on the things? We've still got 24 minutes, so we can right, go we've got to do design crimes. Design crimes. Yeah. Have we got any script for this, or are we just in? I've, well, we've got a bit of script here. You're on page four, so. Okay, ready? Now, our next topic is design crimes. And I always worry a bit about these because, <laughs> you know, I don't like to offend anybody. And it is really subjective. You know, one woman's design crime is another woman's design classic. So this segment is always going to be divisive, controversial, and basically a bit judgy. But maybe <laughs> that's why you all love it so much. Oh my God. Well, this is why we're bringing it back. When I put on the uh, Facebook group, the Great Indoors Podcast Facebook group, what would you like us to talk about? Everybody was clamouring for bringing design crimes back. But here's a disclaimer. Please don't take it too seriously. It's just a bit of fun. <laughs> um, it's ultimately every week, either you let us know what your design crimes are, write into us, let us know what they are, or we will stumble across one, as we have done for this episode. Well, as you say that, I've just moved into a house. There's about five in every room. <laughs> <laughs> the other morning going, one, two, three, four. Oh, yes. So, so this week. So this week's design crime is care of a piece in the Daily Mail written by the esteemed Michelle Gunton. And it really caught my eye. It may be even taken a shot into a kiss breath. Because <gasps> sound effects. basically me. she's saying that the kitchen island is a design crime. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I saw that, you know, obviously, listeners, we do prepare this show in a bit in advance, and Sophie sent me this email, and I was like, what, I, I mean, I was speechless, how can a kitchen island be a whole design well, crime? Well, shall I read you out the intro to the I piece? I think she was quite cross. <laughs> so, these, this is what Michelle wrote in her piece. So, the kitchen island has finally been knocked off its perch as a domestic status symbol. Mm. I'm utterly thrilled, she says. I've always loathed them. Why? Because they're epitome of style over substance. Routinely inefficient and potentially dangerous. So there you what? go. She's How is a kitchen strong. island dangerous? <laughs> she says oversized cases stranded in the middle of a kitchen. Oh, oversized oasis. carcasses? Oh, yeah. Oases? What's an oasis? A sort of space. Yeah. Okay. Oversized oases stranded in the middle of a kitchen, often surrounded by a couple of bottom crunching, back crippling bar stools, <laughs> yeah. aka adult high chairs, 
with the obligatory integrated bookshelf or wine rack and housing a single hob. They are a sort of too high kitchen prep table that you can't stretch your legs out beneath, often costing tens of thousands of pounds. They become considered the height of kitchen sophistication somewhere at the beginning of the noughties and she goes on to rip them apart. I think her biggest bugbear that I'm getting is she feels that it is an excuse for people to hoard loads of kitchen gadgets, clutter, plastic knickknackery, and um, and we'd be better off with a good old fashioned kitchen table. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I had a kitchen island until a week ago. I now no longer have one. There is no space for one. There will be no kitchen island in my new house. But I, I guess maybe when we moved in, I did dream of one. Maybe I did think it was a status symbol. Maybe I did really want it. But it came to be actually incredibly useful for extra storage. And it meant that we had the hob in it and it kept the hob and the kind of working doings quite close to the you kept sink. Working triangle. But I found that that traditional triangle which works for some people and not for others did kind of work for me as well as having extra storage i will agree with her i came to feel that my kitchen island was a very solid slab in the middle of the room it felt and a bit like a, yeah a tanker had landed in the <laughs> middle of the room and and over the years i came to fantasize about the idea of having a kitchen island on legs or I think they now have a name is it something like a dairy table what you're seeing now which I would love but this will be the new status symbol somebody will take issue with this in a few mm. years it, it is a prep table but it has very wide drawers so that you can get lots of storage in it however well, you, still, you can still see the floor below you so can still see so it makes so your room look bigger attractive. but what I realize when you know you do those when I can't sleep people do all sorts of things when they can't sleep sleep some people count sheep. You can look out of your window and count sheep. When I can't sleep, I decorate rooms. I redecorate rooms in my head, and that's what I do. So over the many years of living in the old house and redecorating the kitchen in my head, I would think, oh, I can have, you know, not have a kitchen island, have a table so with what storage would you do? in it. But we didn't have the luxury in our old kitchen. Weirdly, you can call a kitchen island a luxury. That took a hell of a lot of storage for mm. us. And without that, we didn't have room. To, to keep everything else. So, so I, I, you know, that's why I feel that I, it, you know. I think maybe one, I agree with you because for example, I think of kitchens that I've designed over the years and the ones that have had islands, have absolutely needed an island. I mean, take my mum's annex here, which is modern and open plan. It's open plan, kitchen, living, dining room. It's yeah, got it the walls. Yeah. And if, and her island has her hob in it, um, the oven is actually on an adjacent wall and then the sink is so that sort of like creates a triangle but underneath that hob is all her drawers for everything else and if she did if she just had a table there there would be no cutlery drawer there would be no pan drawer there would be no plate drawer there'd be nothing so I think with I think maybe the the, the, the trend for open plan spaces has brought with it the necessity mm. of a kitchen island because you can't put the units up against the wall yeah. not there you don't so have really turn yeah. an island I think it's really interesting, though, the concept of it being a status symbol. I remember years ago when I was a judge on the Great Interior Design Challenge, it's really interesting what people's perception of you is. And I showed a picture of my kitchen, which doesn't have a kitchen island. It doesn't have space for a kitchen island. It has a kitchen table. Yeah. Um, and it has a pantry where everything else yeah. is. If it didn't have that, I'd be in serious trouble. And someone messaged me going, gosh, I'm so surprised that that's your kitchen. I really imagined that you'd have a large kitchen island. Oh, wow. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Because they saw me yeah. as a TV judge, pinnacle of so it is design and sophistication. How did I not have a kitchen island? And that's uh, really I thought that, and I thought, I, yeah. I remember feeling quite wounded. Like, oh my God, I really let people down by not having the <laughs> kitchen <laughs> island. I mean, there was certainly, and I know over the years, you know, I've talked to people and everybody's dream is to have a kitchen big enough, firstly to eat in and then to have an island. So it has got kind of wound up in that mm. status symbol. And I do think they can get too big. And, you know, you can't necessarily sit at them. What I did notice was ours was we had an extension at the back of the old house where we had the table. 
and yet everybody congregated around that island and uh, we we had a hobby now as not the sink because i somehow thought it would be nicer to you know be the tv cook as it were you could stand there cooking mm. something and talking to people rather than washing up or stacking it with dirty plates and yet we had a beautiful table where everybody could have sat and everybody always sat or stood around the island to the point where i ended up in in after one of my 4 a.m redecorating moments contacting a company to see if they would make me a massive chopping board that I could put over the hob when it wasn't being used so that it would look nicer for when we were standing around the island <laughs> entertaining obviously you know reality comes in and I didn't do that but you know that that was the point that that was the point where people congregated even though we had a table so yeah no I think they've got a lot going for them I think if you've got a a large enough space they yeah. kind of make sense because otherwise you've got to do something with that space i think it's really interesting we talked to mary graham from selvinson and graham on the farm board trip yeah. and actually popped this question to her because this isn't something that michelle's come up with this has been written about in the telegraph yeah. this is like news isn't yeah. it <laughs> but in the design world in the just to let all you people know who've just spent tens of thousands of pounds on your kitchen islands can i just say mine came from ikea and cost me you know nothing because ikea did a bit of top well, there you go you don't but they but don't I think need in to terms spend of, tens of thousands of pounds you on don't but people do don't yes. they it has become a bit like having i don't know the car you've got the island yeah. anyway uh and she agreed that they are over and that she's now specifying, like you said, we need to come up with the name of it, whether it's a dairy table, but yeah. it's essentially it's still a workstation, but it's got legs rather than going all the way to the floor. But again, I, you know, speaking as someone who now has a much smaller kitchen, I can't have, you know, I will have to have a that table, storage. but it can't go in the middle. So, uh, you know, I'm going to have to have a table on one side where we may very well have to do all our prep, but I haven't got the indulgence of, because I think those tables where you prep things might be a bit taller or they've got very deep drawers in them so I'm not sure you can sit at them you know it's mm. still a different piece of furniture so maybe the fashion has moved on from the solid island to the more airy table and don't get me wrong status or not I'd love one of those I think <laughs> they're gorgeous but you know I haven't got the kitchen for that well I go back to my family home um which was a knock through open plan country farmhouse type affair had a really oldy oldy Victorian pine kitchen table mm. in it and I think it was before kitchen islands were a thing. Yeah, you know, we're talking 1980s, 1990s. And our whole family life happened around that table. Yeah. It was where we did homework. It's where we ate. It's where we chopped vegetables. It was really, really used. And I wonder whether if that had been an island, that wouldn't have been so good to do your homework. No, because you wouldn't have been able to sit around it. You wouldn't have been able to sit around it. I think if you, if you have a kitchen where you can get enough storage around the edges then rather Think than putting it. an island in the middle, maybe you do put a table in it and that becomes the heart of your home. But I mean, you know, for a lot of people, they might need that for the storage. I'm not sure I'm putting it in the design crime box. I see both sides. I'm an Aquarian. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there are definitely some kitchen islands which are design crimes due to the nature of their design. Well, but as on, a concept, then let's to that. What the makes, kitchen island what is makes not a kitchen problem. Island do you know, I can't bear, I can't bear curved ones. <gasps> Ooh. I can't bear curves curve. in a kitchen. No. I Ooh. can't. What not, is no that? lozenges. No lozenges. No, no, no curves. I like rectangles and clean lines. Ooh. Vintage furniture, but not the curve. It really upsets me. That's my design crime. Depends on the place it's on. I tell you, I the way one, I mean, that kind of building on your idea, but I know this isn't your aesthetic, but when it all gets a bit like belt out pogan pole and it all gets a bit minimal and really hard edged, and literally, if you came mm. in and put your shopping down and your school bag down, you ruined the entire look of this kind of like monolith that's in the middle of the room. So I don't like that island combo where it's just overly minimal and overly sleek and you can't even literally leave your mother's here on the side because you ruin the whole effect. You ruin the look. And I see Michelle's point, you know, you do flip through certain websites and magazines and they all look the same. So she's absolutely right. They've all got the wine rack. They've all got the space for the recipe books at the end. You know, there is a certain type of, of kitchen island where they all start to look the same. And I think, actually, the joy of a kitchen island, if, if it's right for you and that's what you want, then... 
design it so it suits your your lifestyle so some people might have a space for the dog bed at the end of them mm. or some people might have a collection yeah, of lovely vases them, them. modify it so it doesn't just look like every other kitchen just like a different block. Day. And I, I suppose that's you, when it becomes a design price if you are under minimalist sensibility you need it because you need all those drawers yes yeah, you've got to hide the stuff away hide the stuff. can't have any tupperware on the on the uh, <laughs> work surface there you go. Um, can but, you just give me that line again in a more of a oh um, um and if you yeah yeah and i think if you are a minimalist you've got to have a kitchen island haven't you because you know where are you going to put all that stuff i mean you can't have everything on show you're going to have to have your tupperware hidden away in a drawer you're going to hide that tupperware <laughs> if you're a minimalist <laughs> um That's just finish on the bottom of page four i think there's a line and then, then you've got page five just to wrap this one up i haven't got four That's i just gave it to you find. what did you do with it Oh yeah, there it is. The Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do tell us your design crimes, that one. Uh, is, that, is that page four? Yes, yeah, so this is you, and then we're going okay. to page five, which is still you. Oh, goody design crimes. I'm so glad they're back. They're such a lot of fun. <laughs> so uh, if you've got any that you'd like to throw into the hat, you can drop us an email at thegreatindoorspod at gmail.com. And of course, while you're online, why not check out our blogs? I'm sophierobinson.co.uk and she's madaboutthehouse.com. And excitingly, because we are a new series going out weekly, yep. uh, we've opened up a bit of YouTube action. So if you want to not only listen to this podcast, but you want watch to see it, us. watch <laughs> it in its uncut version of a bit it's of quite technicolour behind the scenes then uh, check out our uncut version on youtube links in the show notes and of course over on our blogs etc etc and just to keep you busy we'd also love it if you could manage to leave us a little review in the podcast app it will steady my nerves while i unpack the boxes <laughs> now next time we will be chatting to one of the most flamboyant and recognisable designers in the country, so don't miss it. But for now, thanks to our producers, Kate Taylor and Sarah Cudden of Feast Collective, and thanks so much to all of you for listening. And we'll see you in the great indoors. Bye. That, that's that page done. Well done, smashed it. Absolutely Four. smashed it. You look so good. All right, oh so good. now, F